And we are live. Hello and welcome back. And I'm really, really excited today because I've got um, probably one of my favorite guests that I've had for a long, long time, Helen Fry, who's a historian and just a, uh, a legend in the making. Um, so, well, Helen, welcome to the channel. How are you? I'm great. and It's fantastic that I'm on your podcast. Thank you. No problem. I, I love this because because of my background and things I've done a, a lot of time, and you've probably you're probably hick, uh, excuse me. <laughs> it's a new tongue, I'm getting used to it. Um, you're probably sick of hearing the words, you know, MI5 and MI6 and blah blah blah. Um and, and what it is, I, I remember like years ago learning that there was actually something like about 20 or thereabouts different military intelligence agencies that either became combined or or, or de de uh, defunct or, or whatever the case may be um so the, the kind of dwindled down until they were they were left with mi5 and mi6 is, is, i don't know the exact number but was it about 20 do you know it was it went from mi1 all the way up to mi19 ah, so yeah just a couple of them weren't used and as you're right just a couple of them survive now and then they are morphed with different names and then different things over the sort of course of the 20th century so we don't really have much left now <laughs> well, in terms of what their original names were yeah so and and again a lot of people don't realize that the kind of the, the original origins of um military intelligence uh, 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 pretty much what set the standard for today i mean the, you know kind of the cia mi6 as it were the, this all goes back from world war ii is that right or even earlier actually we can now trace the links earlier that's what we thought originally wow. that a lot of the intelligence methods were developed during the second world war and that's true but if we go way back even just before the first world war the intelligence officers didn't actually get any training as such they learnt on the job mm -hmm. so they had to make it up as they went along using intuition how to run networks behind enemy lines that kind of thing and it really begins to shape up in the first world war and then beyond that it's building on that but it relied on some really interesting people women and men actually mm -hmm. and they were the ones that developed the techniques and of course we've gone on way beyond that today with the modern technology and i guess espionage must be different now although mm -hmm. i don't actually study the contemporary period <laughs> yeah and so that there are uh, there have been a lot of changes but the kind of the concept is still pretty much the same and e even down to the training i mean we'll we'll go into in, in a little while if it's okay with you we'll go into some of the things that mi9 used to do um and it, and and now that you've got the modern day equivalents and they they are still to a degree very much based on a, on a similar kind of principle well, well, that's interesting because, of course, at the end of the war, MI9, which was running the escape lines and, and that whole branch of military intelligence to get our guys back, mm -hmm. uh, was actually disbanded. So the fact that you say this is still continuing today is, is great. Yeah, <laughs> but obviously it, in a different form. Yeah, uh, but, but the, the foundation is still pretty much identical because a lot of the officers um, were, were back then, uh, you know, a lot of the people who were trained were given kind of instructions on how to blend in. Um, and that that is still the case today, even in even in current training right now being done by MI6, by CIA. We're, we're still having that same kind of this is how you're blending. This is what they call the gray man. Um, you know, so you've got no kind of badges or, or, or emblems on your jackets and, and certain things like that. And I know back in the day that um, when this all started, there, there was a lot of people caught through silly little things like not, uh, a lack of local knowledge or not being able to blend in. So can you tell us a little bit about that? I believe there's a, um, a, a case with a gentleman on a cycle. So there's one of our British prisoners who actually managed to escape very early in the war. And it's in one of the training manuals how to avoid getting caught. And he actually manages to cycle around 400 kilometers across German occupied Europe. And he's almost out. But what does he do when he gets to this tiny little village come town? He cycles around the roundabout the wrong way. Ouch. <laughs> so, <laughs> He's picked up, he stands out immediately because the locals are kind of looking and the police officers are looking, thinking, that doesn't look right. Mm. So things like that, I suppose automatic actions like that, where you would normally just cycle without thinking, That's that it. could actually give you away. 
Yeah, uh, and, and of course that is you know so much so the case you know and, and even in modern day today I know of a, a situation not too many years ago where a Russian spy was caught in the US purely because of the way he was ho holding a bunch of flowers. Oh, that's was, interesting. Yeah. Simple as that. That was what, how and why he was caught. So there's a lot of these things that that like that go on today in our training that we have that teaches us, you know, to to, to get local knowledge and, and how to blend in and and kind of like I say, be the grey man. It's called. So yeah, that's phenomenal. Of course, cycling up to a roundabout. If you're English, naturally, you, you without thinking, you're going to go around to the left. And uh, yeah. <laughs> of course, yeah, anybody observing, they're, they're going to spot it immediately. And it's quite difficult to go around a roundabout the other way. If you're in a car or even on a bicycle, actually, <laughs> you've got to kind of pause for a minute to work it out. I suppose after a bit you get used to it, but yeah, you've got to you've got to really work it out. And make sure that nobody notices. Yeah. Yeah, and what was I mean? So you talked you've talked in the past a little bit about escape lines, and so for for anybody who who doesn't know what are, what are these escape lines? So the escape lines, they're not physical in the sense that you can actually see them. So they're a sort of concept in your mind, really. But they are literally lines, if you like, that that take evaders, those of those that are avoiding being captured. They might have been hiding in enemy territory or those that have already escaped and are hiding. They're being helped out by the local population, whether, you know, it could be during World War Two, it could be in Holland, Belgium even out through parts of Germany. There were some Germans who helped mm -hmm. and it into France, obviously. And they were aiming primarily to go over the Pyrenees into Spain, where mm -hmm. they would be picked up by one of MI9's men and would be taken down to Gibraltar, British-owned Gibraltar, and then back to the UK. Mm -hmm. So those escape lines, they roughly go through a route, but mm -hmm. it isn't a physical route you could actually... You could draw it, I guess, but on the whole, they tended to use the same kind of ways from for example from brussels mm -hmm. through to paris but obviously if there's a problem on route they might divert right. so that's what we mean when we talk about escape lines it's a rough route that's tried and practiced that the germans haven't discovered but obviously if that's been compromised you have to find a new route and it was yeah. the same if they're going out over the pyrenees because again you could get picked up if you're going over regular routes so they would go higher and higher and on little donkey trails and find new routes. It's quite a, I mean, it's a really tough, yeah. challenging thing, particularly that last part of the journey. Definitely. I mean, I've driven over the Pyrenees myself, you know, in, in on, on the main routes. And even in this day and age, in, in a vehicle, that can be quite daunting, you know, to, to yes. anybody, you know, especially if they don't know the territory. And, and of course, you know, going up and over there on foot sometimes maybe and, and trying to go stay off the beaten track, as it were. Yes. And, and yeah, wow, what a, what a, uh, that, mu that must take a lot of uh, stamina and, and, and the mental kind of strength you must need to be able to kind of keep yourself fo uh, forced to, to keep plodding on as it were must be uh, must be draining yeah yeah it can take days and they never went any other way than by foot actually oh, when they wow. were escaping and they were often escorted well guides that obviously knew the Pyrenees very well but some of them were young women as young mm. as sort of 21 25 and when wow. the first woman she was called Andre de Jong, Dede de Jong, they nicknamed her Dede, <laughs> she was a Belgian girl, took you know a group three of them just over the Pyrenees and arrived at the British Embassy in Madrid and said you know I want to start an escape line and she had a whole load of friends living along <laughs> the Pyrenees that wanted to help her and wow. the british didn't believe that she could possibly have <laughs> taken they thought she was a um, german spy oh wow <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh so, wow of course, That's you know um, it took a while they had messages back to, to london before it was established that she was okay but they really didn't believe it was possible mm -hmm. for this young young thing to have escorted these men over the pyrenees yeah, to be fair, in in like kind of military intelligence history, that has been a problem in the past for like for, for the, the Brits. We we tend to be very skeptical of a lot of things before it's kind of proven, and we go, oh, okay, maybe it does work. Let's jump on it, you know. So, <laughs> but uh, so yeah, um, I, I, I also noted that you were an ambassador for the natural uh, the natural. I'll, I'll get my tongue sorted out at some point today. The, the, the National Center for Military Intelligence. So, can you tell us a little bit about that and? Uh, uh, where what well what it is to start with? 
Yes, so I've been working for a couple of decades or more, actually, with the Military Intelligence Museum, which is based in Chicksands in Bedfordshire. So it's oh, yeah. north of London, mm -hmm. and it's a fabulous museum. It's publicly accessible, but you have to book in advance. You go on their website, right. and it's behind the wire at the moment. So I, it's on an army base. So it's mm -hmm. a bit intimidating, I guess, for public to... You can't just turn up and visit. So no, the no. vision is to bring that outside the wire and mm -hmm. it'll be renamed the National Centre for Military Intelligence. But I think the vision is to include naval intelligence, air intelligence, oh, wow. deceptions, all kinds of things like the Special Operations Executive, anything really to do with that that subject. And my understanding is it's going to be, well, from way back we can go, you know, way back to Elizabethan times or perhaps even a bit before, Elizabeth I with her spy network, and then going up to contemporary times, whatever can be told of yeah. contemporary missions. So that's my understanding and very exciting vision. So I hugely support that. And as one of their ambassadors, I do what I can when I'm asked yeah, to, that, promote oh, that, wow. to promote the history, to make sure the history is recorded. And if I'm in contact with relatives of veterans who mm -hmm. you know 20 years ago would say well i've got a suitcase in the attic but you know one day you know not sure what's going to happen to it and then now 20 years later the new generation say our oh, grandchildren won't want it it'll get thrown away what can i do with it so try and encourage us to be given to relevant museums like the military intelligence museum that will become the mm. national center for military intelligence Oh, that's brilliant! I, I'm um, so we. I don't know. I don't know whether I can actually sign up too late. I'm going to, uh, but we actually still do some of our training at the military intelligence training at Chicksands now, and there are a couple of units that aren't officially oh. recognised at the moment that are actually getting trained uh, at at Chicksands as well, like with inside the wire there. So that's kind kind of interesting. So wow, yeah. So we'll, I'll try and see if I can get a um, a link in the show notes to that, and see if we can get like one or two people to click and maybe visit because that that sounds like something that. Uh, a lot of the audience might find interesting. Yes, um, well, there is um, a website. It has its own website, which is really very good. It was revamped not so long ago. And I'm actually a trustee of the Friends of the Intelligence Corps Museum. So the Military Intelligence Museum, it's had sort of two names in its <laughs> history. So people can always become a friend, friend of the Intelligence Corps Museum, because that, in a way, again, is supporting the history and heritage. Oh, yeah. And they have events and talks and that kind of thing. And it's, it's interesting. It's good to support that history. That's brilliant. Yeah, I'll um yeah. So we'll definitely get a link in in the show notes to that for people to have a little look, because that would be wonderful if we can uh, get a little bit more exposure for that too. So, um, so yeah. So, MI nine. You you've written a book about MI nine. Um, I I I I actually haven't read, like. No, I haven't read it, but it's something that I know uh, or did know a little bit about the history of, and loads of it came flooding back. Um, because when you mentioned in your book Room 900, which was very, very, very top secret, what can you tell us about that without giving too much away about the book? Yeah, I won't give any spoilers, any spoiler alerts, but we do know, and I'm not the first to write about Room 900, uh, Airy Neve, who's the first to escape and make it back to England from Colditz Castle, he mentions it in one of his books about MI9 and his own history. But yes, MI9 is still, I guess, shrouded in secrecy. It was a top secret section of MI9. And MI9, as we said in the beginning, was running the escape lines, it had the escape gadgets and all that kind of thing. But it had this top secret section that was involved in some kind of intelligence work. And the only file that's currently been released into the National Archives in the UK is about Room 900. And it's so slim, there's about five or six pages from memory, hmm. maybe no, no, certainly no more than a dozen. And this was astonishing to me because when I read it, it was really clear that this part of MI9 was involved in counter espionage. So tracking enemy spies, agents, dead letter boxes, that kind of thing, which of course is not escape and evasion. So it no. makes some really interesting aspect to MI9's history mm. and it helps us to reassess part of its legacy. And of course, Airy Neve, when he wrote his book about 50 years ago now, he didn't have access to the declassified files. They only came Got out it. in more recent years. So I had the privilege of being able to work on those declassified files. 
Oh, wow. Well, that, that must have been something because, yeah, that, just yeah. being able to go through those and, and, and like kind of put the pieces together and get some of the missing bits of information and kind of be able to complete the puzzle, that must have been absolutely amazing. Yeah, but a lot of the files as well are really quite humorous. So you have an every camp that British prisons were ever held in in Germany, mm -hmm. um, Stalag Luft Three, the, the Great Escape, it's coming up to the 80th anniversary in March. Uh -huh. You know, the, the tunnel, the tunneling out, <laughs> uh, those three tunnels, Tom, Dick and Harry. Well, of course, that, you know, there's a camp history written on that at the end of the war of cold. It's and all the other prisoner of war camps. And if you read them, it mm. gives you a really good insight into what the prisoners got up to in their time in mm. the camp. And they had forgery department. They were forging documents ready for <laughs> escapes. They were making all kinds of things that they would need to help in their escape. And one of those tunnels in Stalag Luft 3 had a primitive air conditioning unit because they had to <laughs> breathe down there so you think i mean amazing they had all these ingenuities and of course they in cold it's they made that glider out mm -hmm. of packing the sort of thin packaging of the red cross boxes and those were bringing <laughs> parcels in and goods chocolate and all that kind of things for the prisoners but they used the packing and there was a program not so long ago maybe a couple of years ago on the television which actually demonstrated that had they used that glider and they were going to use it but i believe the americans liberated cold it's before they needed you know, to escape through it mm -hmm. but they reckoned it would have actually flown oh wow <laughs> so incredible because you can make this glider uh, out of these wooden packaging and would it have actually <laughs> yeah. flown and they decided they did all these experiments and recreated it and said it actually would have it flown. would have worked oh wow you know, like, <laughs> A lot of kind of legendary stories around the, the funny things that happened in the camps and it they were a bit like and the, and the men said themselves the prisoners said themselves it was like a camp for naughty boys and they were always <laughs> up to various mischief yeah which, i can believe that which kept them kept up their morale kept them mentally fit and sane mm -hmm. that's one of the things mi9 impressed on them if you're in captivity and some of them, if they were captured in 1940, were there for five years in the in the mm -hmm. camps. You've got to keep sane. Yeah. And this was the way they did it. They had activities, um, arts, crafts, theatre, but they were also busy making all these little bits and pieces that would help support various escape attempts. <laughs> and I just found it fabulous. Well, yeah, I, I can believe that. that. There's so much come to mind with that because, uh, you know, obviously when you're in these camps, when, you, when you've got like basically a, a, a band primarily of, of, of rogue men, as it were, you know, usually mostly soldiers and airmen and that kind of thing, um, you, you, you can imagine they're not going to sit there twiddling their thumbs. Uh, you know, so I, I can imagine a lot of the banter that was going on just, just with, you know, some of the military guys that I've worked with in the past, you know, uh, and the mischief that they get up to, um, never mind being, being stuck in a camp, dear me. Um, glad, glad I wasn't there myself, but, um, but yeah, at the same time, they, I should imagine they, they have uh, some, there's a, there's probably a lot more stories that haven't made it to like that are very funny that than, than the ones that have um yeah, so it could be yes and they yeah. made their own uniforms that they were going to escape in so they would make for example a german uniform uh that's how airy neve escaped in um the uniform of a german officer and it had to be precise mm -hmm. it had to be really exact so they spent time making that and they obviously it gave them a very positive effect and some of them really did manage to escape that way so wow. there's a whole industry inside <laughs> these prisoner of war camps a whole escape industry completely hidden from the guards of course and occasionally the guards would find a tunnel i mean they knew our guys would try and tunnel out yeah but it was really trying to to keep one up over on the guards our guys keeping it as quiet as they could and sometimes they would dig a fake tunnel fairly um, close to the surface. The Germans would find it and think, ah, oh, great, we foiled cool. that escape attempt, but the real tunnel is much further down. I mean, <laughs> it's just so clever. Yeah, I mean that that's, that sounds again very kind of um, very much like some of the, the tactics that are even used to this day, where, where you'll put a decoy out and you know, that decoy tunnel to kind of you know get them thinking, ah, brilliant, we, we we're good, we can let our guard down a little bit now, and it keeps them away from, like you say, the actual tunnel that's being dug. So, um, with that in mind, I know MI nine were involved in getting packages sent to uh, some of the prisoners of war there, um, and there, there's a mixture of things. Now we we have a modern day equivalent, which is um, um, HMGCC, 
and that is uh, his, it's now His Majesty's Government's uh, commun uh, Communication Centre, um, which is in uh, Milton Keynes Park Road, Milton Keynes, and and they they are kind of the modern day version, if you like, of the Q department for <laughs> for making all the kind of uh, so um, so so there's this 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 myth of, of, of it's not a myth but there's this kind of misconception shall we say of gadgets that that um are used by shall, we'll, we'll call them spies for the sake of uh ease uh that are used by spies in the field and and the truth of the matter is and i've tried to sell to say so many people if if i were to land in a foreign country and i'm going through airport i'm going through border patrol and I've got X-ray specs and an explosive case, explosive case of cigarettes, and and a, and a, and a phone that that kind of uh, has got files and tracking devices and all these weird things you know, that are hidden. You know, a, a gun within my shampoo. I'd never make it out the airport. No, you know, <laughs> it wouldn't. It wouldn't happen. Um, you know, so um, so so this kind of this, this myth of all these things is is like you know that that spies have access to is not necessarily true. However. We do have stuff that, that uh, HMGCC uses which have either sometimes hidden compartments or has um, a very well hidden in the software of the mobile phone, have, has hidden applications and that kind of thing. So there is a mixture, but but not to the extent of, of what the James Bond movies make it out to be because obviously if it did, we'd, <laughs> we'd be caught with, with a lot of explaining to do. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so, so yeah, but, but that being said, where where this all originated is from the Q department, from when the, the quartermaster had to kind of change and adapt things and make things, um, and and a lot of that was used way back, like the like I said, the origins of it of when MI nine were sending these packages in. So with that in mind, um, I know you've got a, a little bit of knowledge, to say the least, when it comes to uh, some of the some of the items that were sent in. What can you tell us about those there? About those items. Yeah, well, people will probably recognise some of them. They are quite simple. They aren't, you know, quite the exploding cars and <laughs> pens that Ian Fleming created for his Bond character. But nevertheless, they're practical. So you have the button compass, for example, mm -hmm. which is the miniature compass, very, very miniature compass, about the size of of my thumb now, which is quite mm -hmm. quite tiny, actually. <laughs> and these are incredible. You could easily drop it and lose it. But these were hidden in the back of the first the top button of a service personnel's uniform oh, wow. and the only way you could access that was to unscrew the back mm -hmm. but Christopher Clayton Hutton who thought of the idea he was a sort of Q <laughs> he's one not the only inspiration for Q <laughs> in the Bond novels but he realized that if you unscrew it the wrong way counterintuitively then the germans won't work that out and they didn't those they never mm. found those miniature compasses but they're you know very very useful but they can hide all kinds of things garot wire you know <laughs> inside <laughs> shoelaces uh little hidden compartments in games maps in a pack of cards you know mm. you could well it has to be printed on the inside of the card you can't have the card looking thicker than a normal pack of cards yeah that looks a bit odd so all kinds of things that would be useful and they would send in items into the prisoner of war camps if they requested them like if they requested ink and that kind of thing to help with forging documents so all this stuff it's it really becomes an industrial mm -hmm. scale sort of gadget making and to give you an idea of that you you may well know this already but 1.6 million um of the escape scarves if you like mm -hmm. scarves uh, maps 1.4 <laughs> million compasses miniature compasses I mean, that's a huge number yeah, that's a massive amount. And and the, the button compass is actually still used by a lot of people today as part of their escape and evasion kit. And uh, I've, e I've even known some of the military guys who glue them to the side of their rifle. So as that, you know, just to make sure, rather than keep getting the compass out and kind of, you know, they can just literally flick their rifle over, have a little look and see, just, just to get a general idea that they're, they're still heading in the right direction kind of thing. So, um, so yeah, and that, so that those, like I say, those are still used today, not as a primary um you know navigation source but but definitely you know definitely useful so mm. yeah really interesting and there was there was some chess sets as well i believe is that right 
Yes, anything. They got Waddington's involved that manufactured the board game, which of course they still do today. But chess sets, yes, you could hide something in the, the knight so that the head of the knight would unscrew, again, the wrong way, if you like, <laughs> yeah. and there would be a hollow area which was made waterproof, so it had a waterproof lining, and you could smuggle in ink, for example, that kind of thing in that. So anything, any way that you could hide something they mm -hmm. would in the ends of pencils. That's an obvious one. You could roll up something and put in the end of a pencil. They wow. created fake sweets, fake walnuts. I mean, <laughs> just, just incredible, really. Yeah, yeah. I can, I can see a problem with the fake sweets as they were coming through. If they, you know, if they didn't quite make it past the gatehouse and all of a sudden they're like, hang on, there's something in this. Um, but the, it's, it's interesting you mentioned that about the, the button screwing the opposite way and, uh, and, the, and the, the knight's head screwing the opposite way. Um, even at the height of the Cold War, we were still using what was nicknamed dockyard shrapnel and there would be bolts, big massive bolts and that kind of thing, which the head of the bolt would, would screw off uh the, the the main body of the bolt and the, the bolt itself will be hollowed out inside to put things like um meeting arrangements or or information that would be then kind of um screwed back and then go down to to uh, what would be a dead drop or a dead letterbox and then they'd drop it somewhere for the the asset to then later on come and pick it up i've actually still got one of those bolts and again they they screw the opposite way around and and everybody who i show it to instinctively the first thing they try to do is unscrew it counterclockwise you know and, and yeah. it goes yeah goes the opposite way and 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 yeah it, so but yeah that, that was still and is still used um it, it or similar things are still used today Mm, it's so clever, isn't it? I've got a friend who's got a door handle. This just sounds very basic, but she's got a door <laughs> handle that, that kind of opens. Someone obviously, you know, her builder years ago must have fitted it wrong. I'm not quite sure how you can fit the <laughs> door handle wrong, but you have to open it. It kind of opens backwards, you know, the handle itself. Yeah. It, it looks okay on the door. Mm -hmm. So I said to her <laughs> one day, you've got an MI9 door handle <laughs> and actually she'd never really thought about it before because you're so used to using it but it is a bit weird when you use something that doesn't quite do what you're expecting it to do yeah i've, I've, I've seen that done a couple of times for people who have dogs and the dogs kind of claw at the door uh and pull the handle down so or, and, and be able to get out so they, they turn the handle upside down so that the, the handle lifts rather than goes down so the dogs can't get out so uh yeah. clever little trick for the the dog owners now <laughs> Even in this day and age, CIA have got uh, three groups of people that they don't impersonate ever under any circumstances. Um, and that's the press, the Peace Corps, and any kind of religious entity of any sort. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason they do that is because they don't want to ever limit or hinder any of those people getting into uh, areas or war zones or whatever when, when mm -hmm. you know, they don't, don't want to take any chances for them. So they never kind of use those as, as any kind of cover, even, even today. However, um, from what I can gather, the Vatican is or was involved in a lot of um, the, the kind of World War II uh, escape assistance, wasn't it? So uh, can, you, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, and whether it wasn't proactive, I don't think. So it didn't go out necessarily to to help the Allies, but, but when help was needed, it, it did in circumstances. So Italy, MI9 operated in Italy, mm -hmm. and there's a case of one of the escapers, Sam Derry, he later becomes head of MI9 towards oh, the wow. end of the war. And he's working just at the side of the Vatican with... Um, a Monsignor, so not quite the level of Cardinal, but Monsignor mm -hmm. Hugh O'Flaherty. If you Google him, he's the Scarlet Pimpernel. There's a <laughs> film made about him years ago, this, this Monsignor, he was nicknamed the Scarlet Pimpernel. And they ran the Rome Escape Organisation together, Sam Derry and the Monsignor, that saved over 4,000 Allied personnel in wow. Italy. I mean, it's an incredible legacy. And by the autumn of 1943, the Germans got a price on the head obviously clearly mm -hmm. of sam Derry. they want him they know he's helping a lot of our guys who are hidden in the trees and you know in the in the forests and woods behind the trees in and around rome and wow. eventually he's smuggled into the vatican and he's hidden in the vatican mm -hmm. and he and the monsignor actually run the escape organization until liberation in the vatican and the pope definitely knows about it pope Pius the 12th 
definitely knows about it. And the prisoners start knocking on the back door of the Vatican to be let in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so wow. some of the prisoners are being sheltered there. So it is an interesting legacy. And they also helped MI9 with some of the funding. Mm -hmm. they, let, they loaned them funding and that kind of thing. But more than that, we don't know. I don't know what's in the open Vatican files. They'd only just opened as my book was coming out. Oh, wow. Oh, so you've got a new task coming up then. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm busy on something else at the minute, but whether I'll get back to Italy, we'll see. Well, yeah, that'll be interesting. I, I love the way you said they knocked on the back door of the Vatican, and and yeah. and of course, um, so for for anybody who doesn't know, because you know, you say, oh, you, you hide them, and it is, we're not talking like an Anne Frank broom cupboard here. The no. Vatican is so huge. It, it, I mean, it's it's a literally. It, it, it's that big it's got its own police force it's it's yes. a, it's a massive place so um so yeah wow what a, what a, a great place to kind of be hidden uh and it definitely be interested to go interesting to go and see uh those newly opened files so um can you share with us what you're currently working on or is that top secret <laughs> well nothing i do is top secret it's not just, anymore uh, it's declassified well i'm working <laughs> yeah i'm doing <laughs> i'm doing some really exciting research and i'm so inspired it's a story i've known about for a very very long time and wanted to write about mm -hmm. so it's the mi6 networks i call it mi6 it's secret intelligence service networks yeah. behind enemy lines in world war one and world oh, war two wow. in belgium so no. we know a bit about the World War One White Lady Network, La Dame Blanche, but we don't know about the World War Two one has effectively not actually been written about. It had a successor oh. unit called the Clarence Service and also another one, Mill. They were both SIS MI6 networks. And I think it's I think it's okay. Some of the files are actually available now. Mm -hmm. And so it is a story that can be told. So we'll tell what we can tell. Mm -hmm. And both of those networks in World War One and World War Two gave MI6 its its most intelligence from behind enemy lines. So wow. yeah, that's that's what some up and it said something similar to those words in its official history, in the mm. MI6 official history, which was published about a decade ago now. Mm -hmm. So that's something which I think, you know, we must remember the legacy, particularly the Belgian women and men because so little has been done about them mm -hmm. and the belgians themselves are starting to reclaim their history it's not something they've ever focused on before and that's something which myself and a number of historians are finding if mm -hmm. we're working on i've got a colleague who's doing a lot on polish history and polish agents hugely um, brave behind enemy mm. lines others working on agents in france and those countries France, Poland, Belgium, uh, just starting on Luxembourg, they're interested and they haven't really studied their history, mm -hmm. especially the Second World War, in the same way that we have. So they're, they're catching up. But it's a really exciting time because it's producing a very uh, important cooperation. So for me, I've been working very closely with the Belgians and it's exciting because yeah. we're on a journey together. And <laughs> I know some of my colleagues are finding the same thing. It's a really exciting moment. Yeah. Oh, wow. I, I, I actually love Belgium. I've spent a lot of time there. And uh, I, 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 I used to go there quite frequently um, with, with, like, kind of with Brussels and the UN and everything operating from there. Mm. The amount of kind of espionage and spy activity that is going on in Belgium is, is, is phenomenal. Yes. Um, so, of course, you know, w everything from. So, you, you, you had like obviously the World War II involvement and the networks of, of, of spies uh, then. And then. Then you had uh, the Cold War, and it was the idyllic meeting place um, for a lot of kind of um, activity. Um, and then at the the end at the end of the Cold War, when everything was going south, as it were, um, <laughs> spy activity actually rapidly increased. It was crazy. So it, it it was it was really really weird how it all changed because. Everybody seems to think, oh, yeah, you know, the, the Cold War ended in the 90s and then we all went our own separate ways and, and we were all happy. And, you know, and it didn't work like that at all. In fact, the spy activity between the US, the UK and Russia and everywhere, it just it, it exploded. We needed okay, to know yes. that they were actually doing what they were supposed to be doing and not just saying, yeah, yeah, don't worry, leave us to it. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll do it. You've won. Um, so so there was a, it, it just it, and, and even now today, there's more. Russian spies in the UK and the US than there ever was 
in, during the height of the Cold War, and vice versa with with in, uh, British in in the in the um, I went mm. to say the USSR. Then it's not, <laughs> but in Russia or the Russian Federation. So it, so it's amazing. And then obviously after the Cold War, then when you've got the United Nations operating mm. from Brussels, that was when again it just. Uh, exponentially, kind of hit the stratosphere with the with the amount of activity that was going on there. So, so Belgium has a massive um, kind of history for for like kind of the spy world, and and it's it's wonderful. And uh, yeah, like I say, it's, uh, it's been it's, missed, it's, hasn't it? People oh, definitely. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I haven't looked at the Cold War period beyond for for Belgium, so I'm just concentrating on World War One and World War Two. Mm -hmm. But it was so significant to think that they were, you know running one of our most important networks i mean yeah at one point you know 75 80 percent of our intelligence in world war one from behind enemy lines mm -hmm. came from belgium and luxembourg or well, luxembourg yeah. a bit later towards 1918 so it's just incredible and it's all it's been completely missed yeah. and they paid a sacrifice you know they did lose their agents agents were mm -hmm. shot yeah uh, for what they did for us and so i think it is time to tell that story, to to give it uh, fresh fresh light, and to yeah to to pay tribute to them. I'd love to know. Well, we can't really do much research from the back end of MI6 because their files aren't released. But mm -hmm. there are two or three characters there that were instrumental in running these lines in Belgium, mm -hmm. and it would have been nice. Maybe maybe I can just do a paragraph on them, but much of that still remains quite there they'll never comment when you know historians aren't allowed <laughs> into their archives or anything no, like that. no but we'll just tell the stories from as far as we can mm -hmm. and and make that assessment but i think that is a story that's timely and one that i think a decade or so ago no publisher would have published it would have thought it was too obscure yeah but it just shows how we've changed mm -hmm. and as i said just now for me the exciting moment of being able to work with enthusiasts within Belgium yeah covering their history and as I said my colleagues working in France Poland and and actually I've got another colleague who's done a bit of work in Denmark again looking at the archives and working mm -hmm. with those countries now to reclaim that heritage I think it's really important oh yeah well I, I'll definitely be buying a copy of that when you release that so I, I want to be first on the list to uh, <laughs> to get a, an advanced reader copy maybe and uh, have a little look because that, that, yeah. that's something I'd definitely be excited to uh, to look at so um so I'm, I'm aware of the time and obviously you know it, it, we, we're coming up to um the 40 minutes and I promised I wouldn't keep you too long um so uh mi9 where can people buy the book because we, we've, we've kind of touched a little bit on some of the content um where can people get that Oh, there's so much more in the book. I mean, really fascinating. I think they'll love it. Your your audience will love it. Yeah, they can buy it through regular book stores on Amazon. They can go to the publisher's website. I think that's a free delivery like it is with Amazon. So anywhere, really. I mean, some bookshops do stock it already. So, mm -hmm. yeah, just um, have a little look around. And, and certainly if your local bookshop doesn't have it, and we do like to support the bookstores, mm -hmm. then they can order it in within a day or so. And they are available in, in the US as well and, and outside of the UK. It's Fantastic. a really important, important topic. And the Americans had an equivalent of MI9. Mm -hmm. uh, they basically drew from us and <laughs> then sort of had their own gadgets and that kind of thing. And they were operated primarily in the Far East. So, again, another very important part of the story that there was the American, mustn't forget yeah. the American involvement as well. So I think and your I, audience will love it. Oh, definitely. Because I, I think the the, orig the origins of the American kind of intelligence services, I think, we were in Canada to start with, weren't they? And, um, and then relocated afterwards, is that right? Well, that, that was a sort of intermediary, but a lot of the – Anglo-American intelligence relationships were forged here in the UK. Of course, first at Bletchley Park, the code-breaking <laughs> site, yeah. on the 8th of February, that document that signed 8th of February 1941. <laughs> but as I discovered from my other books, I've written about the eavesdropping program, the walls have ears in World War II. That had a very close American intelligence relationship that was cemented mm -hmm. after Pearl Harbor, almost immediately, two weeks after Pearl Harbor, so we're talking December, of course, mid-December, towards the end of December 41, the intelligence officers start arriving in the UK for training at our special sites, and then they start becoming part, integral part of this joint operation. And it's a very exciting relationship that, that's been missed, really. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's quite a bit being done about the relationship with Bletchley Park and the American equivalents. 
but the the it's beyond that it's wider than that mm -hmm. and it cements something which of course is still so precious today so for me these these nuances and understanding of history yeah i just love it i love it <laughs> I, I think it's important that we we do tell these stories where we can yeah definitely so um so where can people find you i've got my own website mm -hmm. so you can find my official website helen fry.com i'm also on social media on twitter x and on facebook i'm more active on twitter x <laughs> i've also with regard to the eavesdropping program i wrote about there is an official website now which i've managed on thesecretlisteners.com i right. think they find that fascinating and again a whole raft of veterans that like the code breakers need to be remembered Definitely. so yeah i'm out there you can find me on those channels and please do follow me where you can and we're just keeping history alive you know making sure people understand the history yeah because fantastic. you know it's not taught so well in the schools these days or, or mm. if it is taught it's it's not given very much time and mm -hmm. so we're increasingly coming across people working out there in the media world the youngsters yeah. who know very little about the second world war and i think we do need to remember the lessons of various oh conflicts. definitely yeah there, yeah there is so much in in the modern day and age that that the origins uh, you know that, that basically the, the the second world war pretty much shaped so much of what we do today it's unbelievable so yeah the, the perfect reason to like you say keep history alive as it were so um helen thank you so much for joining us it's been absolutely brilliant i will put the links to your social media and, and your website down in the show notes for everybody to be able to find as well and uh, is there anything that i should have asked that i did didn't and uh, you would like to let everybody know no i think that's fine just check me out and you're bound to find a book that i've written on intelligence and espionage that you'll probably enjoy for me i think those those stories of military intelligence are, mm -hmm. are fascinating we just think of them as being very dry boring thick <laughs> files full of tons of information some of it quite mundane but actually, there's so much humour. I think some of it's even better than the fiction that's been <laughs> written about ever since. So, so move over the fiction, and we'll bring <laughs> bring some of the real stories to life. Because in many ways, they are they're almost unbelievable, almost like beyond fiction. Yeah. So I think think your audience will love some of the things I've written about, and and Fun. enjoy those books. Brilliant. That's great. Thank you once again. Yes. <laughs> Thank you.